So today we're talking about how challenge and danger help men reach their full potential. And so I've got my friend Brian, who's come down from Orlando. So obviously masculine energy grows through challenge. So you're challenging yourself in college because you have to get up every day and decide to go to school or class or say, I'm going to sleep in and goof around. And they don't really care if you show up or not because no, they got paid yeah. anyways. They got your money. doesn't matter. You can flunk out, whatever. So you're voluntarily choosing to spend a lot of time, effort, and money getting a degree. So you're challenging yourself. And obviously you, like myself, are an entrepreneur and you got all these things you're doing. You got your... Your books are out, your musical arrangements, you got videos and things that you're doing. And so you're challenging yourself as a man to grow your business, get outside your comfort zone, to find a way to reach more people and add more value so you can have more control of your time, make more money, do the things you want when you want with who you want. Right. I just don't know if I experience a lot of danger. Well, life is dangerous. Yeah. You could get... you you could. Get killed in a car accident. You could stub your toe on something and it gets infected and then you get sepsis and, and then you die or you get gangrene. I mean, stuff like that happens. Life is dangerous. A jet engine could fall off a plane and land on you in your living room. Well, I will admit that I make my life a little bit more dangerous in the way that I choose to drive sometimes. But I don't think that's what's meant by the challenge. <laughs> that's masculine energy, though. You're oh, it is? Lewis. Okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that. Well, it, was then, like, it was like this guy. I don't know if you <laughs> saw this guy. was in L.A. He was running from the police on a motorcycle. And the police just kind of were hanging back because there was a helicopter. With, I think it was a news helicopter that was following him. And apparently, they, I mean, you see these videos a lot. And so at different times, this guy's going like 130 miles an hour. And you just see him going and going. And they're watching it live. And the anchors are kind of narrating it. And then he goes through this intersection and there's a car there and he just nails the car and he just smacks into the car and cartwheels and uh, ends up in a, in a heap. He died. He, the dude died instantly. And so you see this on, on live TV. That was obviously very dangerous. But you, you get the guy that's driving the car and just all of a sudden there's some dude on a motorcycle 100 miles an hour just crashes into your car. And well, dies. I mean, the police were probably oh, the guy in the car too. died. No, the guy in the, the oh. I, I don't know about him, but the guy in the uh, the motorcycle died. One time, I did 120 miles an hour on my motorcycle, it was a Yamaha 650 Maxim. It was about 30 degrees, so somewhere in the winter, uh, with, a Je- with, with a Jehovah's Witness on the back. <laughs> that made it an even more of a masculine experience. <laughs> a Jehovah. I mean, that's a funny story, right? Yeah. I mean, this happened to be well, the funniest person I ever met. He just happened to be a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, we made it from the Deltona exit to the Altamont exit, for those who are familiar with this area, in eight minutes. And it was Jesus. like the, the, the exit signs were... 130 miles an 120. hour. 120. The exit signs were like this. Sanford. Sanford and Mount Dora. This is how it seemed, you know. Lake Mary. And then the bridge over, over the St. John's River was like, you saw the bridge coming, it was like, and you're over it. <laughs> I wouldn't do that now, yeah, <laughs> but back then you think you're indestructible. It was. I remember I had my Lotus Esprit. I remember it was, that. Uh, it was a, a V8, uh, 350 power twin turbo. The car was like all like fiberglass and carbon fiber and stuff, and it was a little rocket. And um, I remember I'd get on the highway. I'd go 120, 130. It was turbocharged. And it was, and the car was so smooth at that speed that it scared me because all you got to do is that with the steering wheel and the car's and you're not going to survive that at that speed. Well, that's what I didn't like. I, I was driving around. I was driving a Dodge Charger uh, as a, I just got my car. Uh, the engine blew in July 1st and it took until last week for them to get the parts to replace the engine. Wow. So Hyundai was paying for a rental for that whole period. And I had a Dodge Charger. And it's great if you're going straight. Like you get up to 100 miles an hour and you're going straight as long as you can just keep going straight. But if you had to maneuver anything, oh, that was, that, I'm glad I got rid of that car. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a, a Hyundai Veloster and it handles. You know, like if you're, you're going fast, you, you have some situation you have to move around. You have some confidence to do it. But with those big boat cars, oh, my God, that's terrible. It's frightening to be up at that speed and you're like, well, 
I know I can slow down. That's all I can do is either slow down or, you know, you'd be worried about trying to uh, turn. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah, I don't I like, like a car that handles, you know. That's nuts, though. Because you, you do those things when you're younger. Yes. Because you think you feel indestructible. I mean, yes. you know, you're obviously young. You feel like you can, hey, my whole life's ahead of me. Nothing's going to happen to me. Yeah. And then it's, it's, it's even like in childhood, you think about it, because – when you're kids, you're, we're climbing trees, we're riding our bikes, we're jumping bigger and bigger ramps. And, you know, when we wipe out, the wipeouts are even more spectacular and you get more fucked up and more skin or broken bones or whatever ripped off and bloodied. And, but you still get on your bike and the next, you know, as soon as you heal up, you're, you're back out there, back at it again. But it's like getting messed up and making mistakes and experiencing pain you kind of start to feel the guardrails of life and you go, wow, I didn't feel too good. I don't want to do that again. And as you get older, you get more of that and you learn how to avoid things that are overly dangerous or unnecessarily dangerous and stupid, like driving your Lotus at 120, 130. And if it, even if it's raining out and I think you're you can hit water and hydroplane yeah. and psh- Oh yeah. You're fucked. Yeah. A friend of mine who lived in Bradenton, we were out at the beach and we were like your age and, uh, <laughs> swimming full speed to the horizon you know like we were just swimming out to sea as fast as we could i mean what do you who even does that but when we got when we stopped when we finally stopped to look around we couldn't see the shore we couldn't see the (laughs) oh it's horrifying we couldn't see the uh, beach yeah and so and then he was making jokes about how tampa bay never used to be shark infested but now that since they're coming (laughs) since they're coming through there and dumping so much junk They've caught the world record tiger shark in there or something. And uh, and and we were just so sure that nothing could happen to us that I just started plunging and making a lot of noise, like, <laughs> you know. And then there was like a, a bit of a, a current that felt like it was taking us Yeah, back that's out. what I'm scared of. Right, right. Sharks at the so we, we, we felt unsure about making it back to the beach. So instead we raced for the, the, the pier. Because the pier was a little bit that way, but yeah. we weren't fighting the current. Exactly. And um, we didn't have to make it all the way back in. So yeah, we, you swim we with, yeah, you, with the current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We made it to the pier. to shore and eventually yeah. get out of it. But you wonder what makes you feel so confident. You know, we were just, I can speak for myself. You don't know any myself. better. You don't know any better. I can speak for myself. I was just so sure that, like, there was something protecting me or something, that nothing could happen, that no shark was going to get us. Yeah. Which is not a bad intuition to have. You just have yeah. that confidence with the universe. You I just feel like that a lot when I was younger, fearful. that, you know, you feel like I'm special, I'm watched over. I had a lot <laughs> yeah. of things happen to me when I was younger that made me believe that there was some kind of energy kind of protecting me. Because there were so many instances where I kind of got really fucked up or even killed and things went my way i remember one time we were in uh this was like senior year i don't know if your dad was with us that night or not or but there had been a party at you know high one of our high school parties this was a few months before we we graduated and um everybody was having a good time and then some kids showed up from another school at our party and then they got into a fight or a bunch of fights were happening and then they all got beat up, obviously, because a lot of the guys who were on the football team were there, friends of mine. I was, you know, I was just drinking, having a good time. I'm watching it. There's, there's like four or five fights going on, you know. Some, some of the guys knew uh, um, karate, and so it's like you know, everybody was kung fu fights. So you see all this shit going on, all these people fighting, and so then they get these guys get their asses beat, and then they leave. And they're like, we'll see you next week at like J.C. Parker or something like that. It was someplace in Pompano Beach, and I didn't hear that part. I was, I think I was back in the house at that point. Cause I just want to drink and talk to cute girls. And I, I wasn't interested in getting in a fight. I had a nice buzz on. And, uh, so I missed the part where like, Hey, we'll see you at JC park next week. And so myself and a bunch of the other guys that were there that also didn't hear that part. We're at JC park the next week. And, uh, we're just hanging out cause there wasn't a party or anything going on that I think it was a Friday or Saturday night. And then, uh, we were, my car was kind of far or parked farther away. And then, so we were in a clump of like six or eight vehicles and they, and, and most of my friends, they all had like brand new cars because their parents were rich and stuff. And so I just remember seeing out of the corner of my eye, these three or four cars roll up and they're really close. 
and the doors all open and these dudes big dudes get out they got construction helmets on and baseball bats and my friend just yells run i just looked and i was like i remember i ran as fast as i could and these dudes are all i don't know how many of them 10 or 15 of them are running after us with baseball bats and i heard all this you know this glass shattering in the background and it sounded like cars are crashing into each other as we're running away and then there's like this fence it's i don't know five feet tall or whatever and you know i just you the, they were so close to us but it's like my legs just felt like uh, i mean the adrenaline was pump, pumping obviously but they were moving faster than they should be and i remember just whew, like literally uh like hurtling the fence that was there and then we ran across federal highway and then got across the street and, uh, and then hid in the neighborhood over there. And then we eventually saw some police officers told them what happened. And then they went over. And uh, when we were there, because I'm, you know, I'm hearing all this crash, I'm thinking these guys are destroying my car with the baseball bats. And I'm just going, oh, and I had a sick feeling in my stomach. And then, so we get back and my car is totally in touch because, again, it was pretty far away from where everybody else was. Um, but um, one, one of the guys that was there, he, he had uh, three girls with him. And they all got in the car, locked the doors, and the guy was standing in front of the car saying, open your door. And he's going, no. And the guy swung the bat at his windshield, broke his windshield, broke, uh, you know, shattered all the glass in the driver's door. And so he backed up, and uh, there was a guy getting out of the door, and the back of the car backed right in the car as this big dude was getting out. And it, and it pushed him, you know, back in, into the car. And it, you know, his car smashed into his, and then he turned and, you know, and then he he hauled ass. And there were several other people that their, you know, cars were smashed up and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, but one of the cars got plowed into. And I just remember, I was like, man, I ran like a gazelle then. But yeah. I felt, I, you know, I was kind of laughing, and it was kind of funny to me. I remember laughing as we're running. Cause I couldn't believe this was happening. You know, I'm literally running, running from for my life. And, uh, but like I said, that was one of those events. I felt like there was just kind of an energy. And then like the one we were talking about, um, when Caroline had brought up the, the racism story, like I think it was the last day of school, uh, it was eighth grade and I'm walking to the bike rack to get my bike with one of my friends and we're talking, we're laughing. I'm thinking, finally, that was my last day at, uh, Pompano middle school. And, uh, and somebody, because I had longer hair, I had like parted in the middle. I had like a mullet like everybody else had back in the yeah. day. So <laughs> I got a picture. <laughs> so I had a thick head of hair. And, and so they gra- somebody grabbed me from behind. I just was like, what the hell? And then, you know, my head moved around for a second. And then they, they let go. And I turned around because there, there were so many people walking to the bike rack. And, uh, and all I could see was the like 6'8 principal with some big black kid in his hand around his neck, taking him towards the office. And what my friend had said, he was standing right next to me was that he had, um, when the guy we were talking, he was kind of looking this way. He saw the hand reach over and grab my head. And then he looked at the guy and the guy was rearing back about the sucker punch me from the side. So he pulled my hair back so he could hold my face and punch me from the side. Probably would have knocked me right the hell out. And, uh, never saw the dude, didn't know who the hell he was. And um, I was just a, a little white kid, you know. So Where I was, was the, this? I was the easy target. This was Pomp- Pompano Middle. But like I said, what are the odds that something like that happens and then the principal is literally right there? And right as and so right before this guy's about to punch me, he just grabs his arm, grabs his neck, whoosh, turns him right around and takes him right to the principal's office. And it was like, whoosh, you know, moments like that. Sometimes it's kind of like an intuition as well, too, because I've had it. I used to go ATVing a lot. I still do. I like it. Um, It's probably around 15 at the time. uh, And we were uh, up in Pennsylvania, so there's lots of hills and stuff. We were using this hill to jump off of it. So we'd probably go like, like, gun it like 60 something on these ATVs because they're large, large ones and very, very fast, like 60, 65, and hit it over the thing, get like four, five feet in the air. And I was going with someone, one of my older friends who was like five years, seven years older than me. So I always rode on the back of the ATV. And we were just doing a bunch of jumps all day. It was a blast. It was awesome. And then one time I just got this feeling in my stomach. I was like, I need to just get off this. I'm just going to just gonna go sit down, relax a little bit, take in the nature. I was like, and so I get off. He keeps going on the jumps. So the next jump, 
He goes in there, loses control, spins out, and then right kind of like I'd say 10 feet from where landing from the hill is, there's a 30-foot cliff that falls into a stream. And then he went straight down into it. And he got out of it just fine. No, He could have easily died. If that thing fell on him, that thing's like a ton or something. He would have crushed and just died. And he just got really, really lucky, barely got anything, fell off 30 feet. He was fine. Yeah, because with you on there, you would have had – that's another body and a bunch more weight, and it would have totally reacted I know, no, where the passenger seat was, I would have got crushed by the ATV. I would have got crushed into the hill. I would be, Honestly, I'd be dead or, like, paralyzed if I was there, which is kind of insane thinking back on it. That little thing, just that feeling like, oh, I'm just going to – it's those little things that the universe kind of looks out for you sometimes, I think. Yeah, but it's like we were talking about earlier. It's like that's how life kind of teaches you the guardrails, where the limits are, the the point where you get that intuition. You're like, you better slow it down because yeah. you're about <laughs> to get fucked up really bad. Yeah. And, or it's like you get pissed off with somebody, or you're in a you know you're younger and you don't know as much about dating or relationships, and you assume the wrong thing, and you want to get pissed off at your girl, and you're gonna. And then you feeling I probably shouldn't say that. I probably shouldn't call her <laughs> because I'm mad right now or I don't, I'll say things I regret. And then you listen to it. It works out great. And then you don't. And you call her anyways. And it's like, and you're like, oh, fuck, I should have said that. Pain is a great teacher. Yes. And that's why I think it's bad too, especially nowadays. Everyone's so like trying to just minimize the pain, like especially as children, not have them any pain or anything. They never really learn. The bubble wrap. So when they get, yeah, exactly. So when they get older, they don't know their boundaries and they do stupid shit. And they die between, I think, especially like teenagers driving cars, just texting and driving all the time, just speeding like crazy, probably drug overdoses too, because they just think they're fucking, they're invincible and they're yeah. not, and they don't know the boundaries of life. I think that's a problem too. When you're too bubbly wrapping and trying to protect too much, you, you, you need a little thick skin. That's yeah. The there are always there. guys in like every grade that either during school or right after we graduated in those first two, three years, they got themselves killed. Especially like they go off to college or whatever and it, they'd be drinking or like a, a friend of mine, he was like on a, I think a second floor balcony and he, some girl dropped her purse and he went to grab it and because he was buzzed, he dipped over it because he's a big guy. He dipped over the balcony too much and lost his balance and went over the balcony and, oh. you know, landed, you know, luckily he landed good in a, an area, didn't get fucked up, but he literally fell from two stories. I was like kind of down like a little hill. So when he landed... The impact wasn't as bad, but I know he was who, hammered when yeah. it happened. So I know someone else who was just completely hammered. They felt like I think it was a four or five story parking garage they fell off, and they were only they survived it. Um, they weren't even paralyzed. They just had like a couple obviously injuries, but it could have been way worse. It's just they were so inebriated they didn't tense up and they actually survived. So it kind of saved them. But I mean, it wouldn't be in this situation. When Still. your time ain't up, it ain't up. Yeah. Well, there's a funny little thing here. So. But it's, progress always involves risk. When you want to do something, it's like, look at all the time you got into this stuff. Because you could do these books and never sell any or never sell enough to make it worth your time. You don't know. Right. You're just you're putting together your best stuff and putting it out there to see what people think. Right. Hopefully they like it. Hopefully they buy from it. But at the end of the day, you keep grinding on. Yeah, keep well, this, challenging yourself. This book might be a more limited audience because it's for advanced very advanced classical guitar playing, which is why I included that in the title. If you might I didn't, wanna, Brian, bring it a little more into the frame in the camera because it's not, it doesn't get picked up if you just, yeah, there you go. There we go. Solo guitar arrangements for the virtuoso classical guitarist just published this month. Yeah, so um, that's why I include that in the title because it is for advanced playing. Because maybe people who are beginning or, you know, or not at that level yet would purchase it and they might. You know, if there weren't forewarned, it says right in the title for the virtuals of the class. If they weren't forewarned, it might be discouraging to them. But it's uh, so it's a limited audience. So, what's your reason? Why do you get up and do what you do? Why do you put books together? Why do you teach? Why do you why do you perform? What is it that drives you? Well, I mean, as far as why I play classical guitar, it just kind of happened I, when I was in college. Um. It's kind of like a basketball player, how they get an easy scholarship through their basket for their playing, get a, a, a free free um, free ride to college through their. So that's what I did. I got a free ride to college because of my playing. So I performed for the fine arts department. They gave me a free ride. 
That's awesome. So, but I never intended on transferring as a junior, as a music major, not for a second. I just didn't believe in that. I thought that um, that's a waste of time and money that you, know, you do something. If you're going to spend your time and money, do something that'll make you more. That's what I, that was my thinking. But while I, while I was in my first two years, I was tutoring algebra for the college, and I started performing classical guitar for weddings and stuff. And, um, and I was going to be a math teacher, but then I started also teaching music lessons. And I didn't like it at first, but once I got better at the teaching, I started making money doing that. I started making money performing, and it just kind of happened. I, I didn't plan it. So I started doing pretty well performing classical guitar and teaching music, and I, I wound up staying that way. That, that's, how, that's how that happened. And since now it is my profession... <laughs> I guess the answer, the question why I perform is because you want to be the best you can be at what you do to try and it's just all about being as successful as, as I can be. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's why I keep pushing forward. And a friend of mine talk, told me the importance of how much, how much he, how successful he is in publishing, publishing uh, music arrangements. He does uh, string quartets for modern popular music. So he has to get permissions and stuff because it's modern and current music. There's not a lot of what I play is public domain. So it's actually easy, easier for me to publish arrangements. Um, but he was the one who got me into it and told me about how to get the permissions. And so I, uh, yeah, that that's, so I've been spending a lot of time on that. I just want to get all my arrangements published and out of the way and then move on to my next phase. So, yeah, the answer is just because I want to be more and more successful. Uh, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to continue to try to be more and more successful. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. So your purpose kind of, it kind of chose you. It's How did you get into playing guitar? How did that all start? Oh, guitar itself is kind of funny because as a child, from, uh, no exaggeration, as soon as I could walk, I mean, I was obsessed with the Beatles. My parents had their albums. My parents also had Rolling Stones, Let It Bleed, Janis Joplin, Pearl, Morrison Hotel. They had Beach Boys. Uh, but the only one that jumped out at me as a kid was uh, the Beatles. I just, and I just listened to them constantly. It was the whole reason I, I woke up in the morning. First thing I did, listen to Beatles. And I had other friends on the block who were just as into them as me. And you used to talk about the latest song we were checking out or latest album. But it never occurred to me to play guitar myself. I don't know why that is. It wasn't until I got to high school, and you know, then there's other kids playing guitar, and that's when I got the idea. A couple of friends. Well, the same friend that got me into publishing. Really? Yeah, he's the one. He was one of them that I've known him for that long. We were high school friends together. Of course, we can't mention any names on here. But. Uh, yeah, he's the same one. So that's when I started. And I guess, you know, you're just 14 years old. You just want to be a rock star or something. Or I don't know. You just, you just inspired by those musicians. And so how, how, what was, how did you end up playing guitar? Did you take a class? Did you oh, no, no, no. I, I, was did, self, I was self taught completely. So when did you get, how did you end up with a guitar? Did you decide, you know what? I'm going to teach myself. I'm going to figure it out. Well, no, my parent, my parent, my mother and stepfather, I remember they bought a, a steel string acoustic guitar. From a, a garage sale, probably. And for those who understand guitar, the action was about that high. And I always try and encourage my students to get the guitar set up well so it doesn't discourage you and make you want to yeah. kill yourself. I mean, but the thing is, is, I was just so determined. I just kept playing it. I remember playing the rhythm guitar to the end of Freebird, the bar chords, over and over. And it was like murder. I mean, it was just so hard to press everything. And so, but my first electric, I think I got from a friend of mine. He had a used Gibson, uh, uh, probably a, a used Epiphone uh, SG copy. And I got that for like cheap or something and wound up with an amp. I used to have a Vox amp, an old Vox amp I got from somebody. So yeah, I mean, I just somehow, uh, I was already working. I've been working for, I started working at a very young age. Uh, so I had my own money to buy the things. And then, um, yeah, so I was uh, started working in construction. My stepdad was in construction at, at age 13 uh, on summers and stuff. And then full-time ever since age 16. So I had the money to 
start buying my own stuff. So yeah. was the parents giving you a guitar, and then so you started playing it and figured yeah, it out? Yeah, I think that was my first one, yeah. yeah but figuring out by your right. And how old were you? Uh, well, I was, uh, yeah, 14, I think, 14. So you started playing at 14. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you learn by ear. You learn by ear. I learned by ear, so I had an advantage there. I, I have a good uh, sense for that. I was able to, I remember that uh, I figured out Black Dog. And, you know, I'm back into turntables again. Now I'm collecting vinyl, which is like reminiscing my childhood because I'm, I'm actually buying all the same vinyl yeah. that I had then. It's pretty fun. I have a whole bunch of vinyls, it's really, too. It's pretty cool. But, you know, that's how we learned it back. That's where you had a turntable. So I remember learning Black Dog. You know, you just put the needle on the record as soon as the as soon as it starts, and you stop it. Okay. And they put it back on. Just a little bit of the time, and I figured all the I remember that other guitarist at Oviedo uh, High School, um, where I went, they were all talking about me. He learned black dog, he learned black dog. So yeah. And that's how we all. That's how we all did it, and shared, showed each other tunes. You know. So I was just getting bored with a rock and roll guitar. You know, right around the time Guns and Roses came out, I was totally into that. I, I, I still have a lot of respect for Slash, but then after that, I was just getting bored and looking for a new direction. That's when I discovered classical guitar. So that's when I, and I discovered speed metal at the same time. That's that's so hard. Well, I didn't discover. I my brother was really into Metallica. I just never cared for them. So when I heard Megadeth, Rust in Peace, that was the thing. That's the thing that just blew my doors off. And I discovered that. So I started going to work on that music, which was completely different technique than I've been used to. And, and then at the same time, learning classical guitar. So that's what happened. And you never get bored with those two styles. Speed metal and classical guitar. You're never going to reach a point where you're saying, oh, well, this is boring now. What else is there? You're never going to feel that way. <laughs> I took guitar lessons from Brian for many years. I took acoustic guitar lessons. I took electric guitar. I also played 12-string with them, and there was a bunch of different songs. We used to play a lot of Pink Floyd stuff together, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And obviously, as you guys can tell, I mean, Brian is a master musician, a guru of guitar, if you will. And so if you want to learn Spanish classical or just regular acoustic, you're a beginner, intermediate, advanced guitar player, he does Zoom lessons. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world, Brian will do video Zoom lessons with you in the comfort of your office, your home, your backyard, wherever it is that you happen to be. And so you can learn directly from the man himself, Brian. So tell, him how, tell us or tell the viewers how to how to find you and sign up for your Zoom lessons. Yeah, well, brianhayesmusic.com will take you to uh, either of my websites um, because I perform as a classical guitarist throughout Florida and South Georgia. And so that website, is brianhayesmusic.com is more of a hub site that will take you to one of the two websites. And the uh, so um, and then my lessons uh, site is, is accessible from there as well. And, uh, yeah, I, I teach in person to people local to me and then via Zoom, uh, you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, I have students. Uh, um, and when you when you reach my lessons website, uh, you click on the lessons page, there's a, a place that you can click on to schedule a uh, meet and greet, uh, Zoom meeting or phone call, um, you know, for us to figure out what you want with guitar lessons and what direction we're going to take. As Corey mentioned, I teach... Um, all styles. I started out as a rock player and then got into, uh, you know, heavier metal and speed metal and classical guitar later on. And so um, I've taught students. Uh, I, I guess I could say that I teach. Uh, I'm familiar with flamenco as well. I, I'm not. A, I wouldn't say I'm a flamenco guitarist, but I have some basic flamenco techniques. So I do teach that as well. Classical guitar and all types of metal, blues, or rock and. Uh, but what I've found over the years is that the majority of, of students basically fall into the category of rock or metal. It seems that uh, some form of rock and metal. There's so many different types of metal, right? Uh, uh, but it seems that those are the main two. And, uh, yeah, electric or acoustic. So electric, acoustic, or nylon string guitar. Yeah. That's what I teach. 
And if people want to hire you to come play their event, their wedding, you play. Yeah, right, 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 right. Where, that, my, where, where's the geographic range that you'll travel and play at? Yeah, all uh, the whole state of Florida. And, uh, well, I say South Georgia because Savannah is a really nice place to gig. Uh, I love gigging there, and I get gigs in Savannah. So that's as far as when I take trips. Uh, I, I, I take trips. Uh, uh, that, that's my range right now, currently. But what I play, is, that's important to talk about, because when you go to my website, classicalguitarorlando.com, again, you can access that through brianhaysmusic.com or go directly there if that's what you're interested in finding. But I play solo instrumental guitar. Uh, one of the things that I get and, and when people give me recommendations and reviews is that they find the music to not be distracting. Um, I think when music has vocals and has drums, it is distracting. It does take away from a, a corporate meeting of, uh, or, or and such. Um, those are the three things that I mainly get hired for. Almost every time I get hired, it's either a wedding, a corporate event, or a private party. And it's very advanced music. It's not the type of thing you're used to hearing uh, very much. But those are, who are familiar with solo classical guitar already know what it is. Um, but the the I, I I play a diverse styles though. It's it's it, it, term, categorizing music is is tricky because it needs to be done, but it can be a little difficult at times. I have some jazz pieces in my repertoire. I have uh, a ragtime like the Entertainer. I have. Uh, I do a little bit more than some classical players would as far as the the range of styles, but it's solo instrumental uh, music, so that's what I do. So we're gonna do a so we're gonna do a little demonstration. Brian is gonna demonstrate his classical guitar, his electric, and the type of stuff that students hire him to learn from him, and as well as the kind of stuff he plays at corporate events, weddings, and other private events, so you guys can get a little taste of what he does. The tricky thing is, when it comes to electric guitar especially, and most of my students are electric guitar, and very few want to learn classical guitar. I do have a few of those. But the tricky thing is, in a video like this, due to copyright uh, problems, we can't play cover tunes, and like, and that's a lot of what, what people want. Yep. So it can't be the kind of demonstration that... Maybe we'd like it to be because I can't play the kind of cool cover tunes that a lot of students might want to hear. But, um, yeah, that, that's a big part of lessons is to follow the student's point of interest as far as what type of music they want to play and learn. And so some of that we can't do here. We have to play stuff that's not uh, copyrighted. So. Cool. Cool.
back to um, what you were saying, Brian, you kind of fell into playing. You went with what felt right, what you were naturally curious about. And you had friends, like-minded friends, that were also into it. And yep. so once you got into it and you really started obsessing over it, you, you found out you were good at it. Yep. And obviously because you obsessed over it, you worked harder at it than somebody that was maybe told to learn to play guitar for a job and earn a living. You were doing it because you just want to learn how to do these things. It was fun to you, obviously. Yeah. And so that's why you became good at it. And you became, this applies to any career you go into. When you do things you love and you enjoy that come naturally to you, like guitar, you obsess over it in a way that somebody that's just, eh, well, I'm kind of doing this or it'll pay the bills. And so, because you get so much better than anybody else, then you, it turns into a teaching career as well, in addition to performing. Yeah. And now writing arrangements. Yeah. I never, I, I did that from the beginning, uh, from the very beginning of my playing, I guess because I was used to learning uh, rock and roll songs by ear. I don't know, I just went right to doing that. Uh, I, I try, the first arrangement I ever did was the Moonlight Sonata, which is included in the book. Uh, so I kind of, that was early, uh, I started that way. For some reason, I just gravitated to that. And, uh, but yeah, I never thought about it. I, I, I always knew that uh, when it comes to um, accomplished musicians, the obsession is always the thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, obsessing is what is required to become good. It's the only way to learn, honestly. But, but I guess to Corey's point, it's that I never thought about it this way, but I guess it's true of, of all of all uh, types of careers. I never thought about that. Maybe some more than others. Yes and no, but I still think it holds true. If you're really getting to the top of your level, yeah, you, yeah. You, that's the only way you can do it. It's, yeah. You're not going to any other way. Yeah. Yeah, like the best sports players, they they only do it because they practice every single day. Yeah, they're, it's like they're you with the video it. stuff, and now you're getting a degree in it. And like you were talking about with white balancing a camera, and you know how to do these things, but taking it in class and really breaking it down and understand the technology, it it helped you be better and have a better understanding of these things. Yeah, and the only reason you're taking classes in it. It's because you're obsessing over something you're passionate about. Yeah, I liked it way more than getting a business degree. Even just a lot. Of, I just felt like it was another job. I just was. It just felt like more work. I wasn't passionate about it. it wasn't it wasn't doing it. But the, now, I I look forward to all my classes. I'm excited for it. It's actually just a blast. It's definitely. And then since I'm actually really, I'm, I know what I'm doing too. Classes are easy for me because. That's what I found when I was in upper level at uh, FIU in construction management. I was working in the industry. So I was bidding jobs. I was helping to manage jobs, run jobs, find jobs, pull permits, everything that goes into the construction industry, hiring subs, negotiating contracts, writing contracts. And so I'm taking classes on this stuff, and I'm already doing what I'm taking a class on. So it made it night and day difference, just like what you're experiencing, because you're immersed in this stuff. Right? Yeah, I especially see that comparing to my classmates who are just kind of just getting started with it. I'm like, which is cool, though, because I like interact, because I like helping the people out with it. And I like, the, especially my, say, like video production class, it's nice because it's more just group oriented and doing projects. So we don't have like written finals or anything. We're just working together, making films, which is really cool. It's just because a lot of that is teamwork and because you need a lot of people to do a lot of different things. Well, we kind of have a really nice setup where we only really need like kind of one, two people to really run it, which is nice. But usually it takes a tremendous, so many people. Yeah. Back in the day when I used to do the uh, Good Good Day Orlando show at the Fox aff affiliate in Orlando, it was part of the, our, our, our advertising package. So I would come on and I was like the mortgage and real estate and uh real estate investing type of expert i'd do I don't know, once or twice a month i would come in in the mornings and um so you'd, you'd be on camera giving advice and doing these things and so I, th I think back then they had three or four cameras and each camera has an operator so that's somebody you're paying a salary to operate the camera and like our setup and then you have this giant room with all these machines that break down and change a signal and and send it to the different satellites and stuff with all the massive dishes because i got stuff coming in stuff going out 
And, uh, and here we have basically the same capability that, that they spent millions and millions of dollars to build all that shit out where, you know, for a couple hundred grand, you can have the state of the art, the best stuff, the best sound, and you have that capability. And one person can run, what do we have? One, two, three, we got six cameras, is it? Seven yeah, cameras? Six. Six cameras and one person runs it all because everything's remote controlled. They have motorized bases and everything. And so when you apply yourself at stuff like that, that you love and you're passionate about, it's you become great at it. But well, yeah, when you find your passion about that, you just have almost limitless energy with it. You're never really bogged down by it. You're not dreading doing it. You're looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. I think that's what everyone has to find because it's night and day difference. That's what I, when I was working in the restaurants, it's working the in the business. Between, sorry to interrupt. Power versus force. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting because in the process of publishing my uh, books uh, and arrangements, I um, got into the whole thing of publishing ebooks and the whole uh, publishing e- ebook through Barnes and Noble required me converting to EPUB format and so forth. I mean, without getting technical, but I don't think I'm. I don't know if I'm born with those skills. I mean, but they're required. Like, if I'm going to accomplish that, I kind of have to. Yeah. And I get help when I'm stuck. So you don't really want to do it, but if you want your books on sale, you have to. But what happened, and I have help. I have a friend, a good buddy, who helps me when I get stuck. And sometimes he's learning with me. Like, he didn't know how to do an ebook either. And what happens with me in this case is that towards the end of the day, when I've exhausted myself in all of this, I'm just discouraged. I'm like, oh, is it worth all this time? And I, oh, God. Because, you know, it's not just one book, but the skills I build on learning how to publish an ebook, I'll be able to publish ebooks easier moving forward and new books that I publish. But so I, I, go to, I go to sleep at the end of the day just discouraged and questioning myself. Like, is it worth all this work? Oh, my God. But then I always wake up feeling stoked. <laughs> like, then I wake up wanting to go back to it again. And I'm, I kind of see that people who are in that field, you know, in the, in the tech fields, you know, and uh, programming or whatever and web development, I think that's how they become that way. It's, after a while, you, you get to like it. <laughs> So I wake up the next morning, just want to jump on the computer. That's the thing I want to do the most. Well, let's go to work on that again. Especially with stuff like that too, especially you're having like a problem the day before, you just get frustrated with it, you go to bed, you just wake up the next morning, you just figure it out easily. It just kind of works itself out. Yeah, and many times too is I go to to sleep thinking, okay, well, I I got stuck with that. I can't finish. I can't complete that task. Uh, I gave it a college try. And it gave me a, it gave me an a, an awesome good old fashioned butt kicking, and that was it. I'm good. I'm good. I, I gave it a try. But then I wake up the next morning and I'm still. Oh wait, wait a second. Did I tr- maybe I can still try? <laughs> I try and follow the Elon Musk uh, philosophy to never give up. Right. Yeah. So like you say, you wake up and you have renewed energy, and then you're like the night before you're like, okay, that was my last try. I give up. And the next morning you're like, oh well, yeah, I- it's helpful to take a break and say, you know what, I'm gonna come back tomorrow with a fresh set of eyes, yeah. maybe chillax, have a glass of wine or a beer or a piece of cake or something, watch a movie, and then get a good nice rest. And you wake up the next day and then you're like, oh, maybe I should try it this way. Because I mean, you just try a different permutation. If that doesn't work, you try something else. And you keep trying different things until you find the things that work. But as part of business, you're you have to constantly innovate. Technology changes. You get competition. You get people that that copy your stuff, and then they there's always somebody that's up and coming that wants what you have. And so that's why you always got to innovate. You always got to keep growing your reserve of knowledge. You always want to continue to develop your gifts, your skills, and talents, yeah. and finding more efficient ways to monetize your time mm-hmm. and the things you know, so you can make make money while you sleep. Obviously, like having books to sell, yeah, yeah, or merchandise. Sleep, yeah. Yeah. In addition to the lessons and all yeah. that stuff that you yeah. the Zoom lessons and stuff. Yeah, good time. That's it's, what you used to say all the time. It's back good, in the time. Day. good time. Yeah. The interesting good time. the this whole brings up that the Steve Jobs quote: "You must follow your heart, your curiosity, and your in- intuition because they somehow already know what you want to become." Yeah, that's what you did with what you're doing. That's what you did. That's what I did. It's obviously what Caroline. She was always playing around with cameras and stuff like that when she was a little girl growing up. And now here she is. She's got the same thing with us, social media. She's doing the whole thing herself as well. Just 
you start working at things you're naturally curious about and that are fun and enjoyable and you obsess over it and you spend so many hours obsessing and you're having so much fun doing it, you eventually develop your gifts, your skills, your talents, those natural inclinations to pick up the guitar you got as a gift and I got to figure out how to play this thing. Yeah, well, maybe there, it's a lot of luck. Like some people might not have been as fortunate and maybe their hobby they weren't able to turn their hobby into a career, you know. But nowadays with the internet and the marketing, if people can be clever with that, it's it's probably to the point where no matter what you do, you can really make something out of yourself. Yeah, you got to do two things as successfully in a business. You got to number one, you got to innovate, and number two, you got to market successfully. You got to find the people that want the solution to the pain that your product or service solves. Yeah, over deliver. <laughs> under promise over deliver as we always just say back in the day we it's funny that you brought up pain because a friend of mine a good friend of mine um was the owner of uh, roof masters of central florida and he used to say that that was the secret that rain equals pain <laughs> so if someone's got a roof leak or something the rain causes them pain and then they he's call the, him yeah he's the solution to the pain <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny. true it's funny yep like the, all this editing and this camera stuff and this technological garbage, I mean, I like the end result, but getting there, I mean, I like helping put together and assemble all this stuff, but like the sitting down and the editing and all that stuff, that's why I love that Chunky loves it. And obviously Caroline really loves doing that stuff. And then so you guys do things you love, and that allows me to focus on things that I love doing. Yes, exactly. Do you want to pull the mic down and say that into there? All right. No, yeah, then we have to stop the recording and redo it. It's kind of oh, really? It's a, it's a pain in the ass getting. You can't just add another. Uh, you can't now. You can't audio? if the garage band's going. You can't get rid of a mic or take out a mic. Damn. Okay. That's a good enough th thing to learn. I take it we learned that the hard way. Uh. Or we tried to do that before. And... No. Yeah. Just just figuring out trial and error. That's the biggest thing too. Trial and error is huge. You yep. can't you can't get frustrated and just keep letting that perpetual frustration get to you because you're never going to get anything done. Yeah, you have an emotionally compelling reason why you're doing it, and that's why the challenges or the things that go sideways or the problem you were having with an EPUB doesn't stop you from each day. You get, I got to figure this out. I get, you get a little each day. You get a little further. Yeah, and then you can and use you that. Just keep hammering away. You use that frustration as fuel too. Yeah. So once you accomplish that, you feel way better. You feel awesome once you get it over. You're like, oh, I, hell yeah, I solved that problem. I did. It. I overcame that challenge. I think that goes back into the thing where men like the challenge because that's how they kind of like prove themselves and always kind of keep on growing. Because I think that's the reason we're all really here is just keep on growing and just attune to our higher selves almost. Smooth out the rough edges of yeah. your soul. Well, that's how the human race has has done it. That's how we've accomplished it so much. I mean, just a little bit. They had the Wright brothers. Imagine, right? They were just trying to get off the ground, and now we're like out into space. That's kind of incredible. Going to be yeah. colonizing Mars in the next ten, twenty years. Yeah. And eventually terraforming it. Yeah. How crazy is that? They used to be sci-fi when we were growing up. Now they're scientists. Like, oh yeah, we're yeah, that, definitely that, going to do this. That movie we talked about. That movie. Uh, what's the name of it again? And and that comes from Elon Musk. Total of, Recall. Yeah. Well, no, th there's a movie that that's the thing. I'm glad you mentioned this because Elon Musk, uh, he he mentioned which movie it was. There's one movie that inspired his whole SpaceX business. Which one? And I don't know. I have to look it up. I'm gonna look it up, and then I want to see it. But it wasn't it wasn't Total Recall. But it's something that's a quote I just saw recently, so I should be able to find it in a Google search. But that's another another guy who just. First, he had the, uh, I forget it was his, his company, the first one he had, and then eventually, then he had PayPal, and then after PayPal, then he got into Tesla, and um, uh, what was the other, and then SpaceX started that, took all his money made from PayPal, and then put it into Tesla and SpaceX, and just obsessed over that, and he was within a hair's breadth of totally going bankrupt and losing everything, and not only his money, but lots of his friends and family's money that because he had put all of his money in both companies and he had literally nothing left and he was borrowing money from his friends to pay rent. And this guy had been w walked away with over a hundred million dollars from, from PayPal. And he literally had nothing because he had invested that. 
Plus, he'd convinced all his friends and family and people close to him and other investors and had invested a shit ton of money. And it was literally like when they were on, I think it was their fourth and final rocket that they had the money. The first three blew up. And so if the fourth, fourth one blew up. Yeah, that was going to be it. That, that was, was it. it. Yeah, they had imagine. no money to do anything else. Oof. And then the government's like, why? Are we, we're not going to give you any contracts. Your rockets all blow up. You don't want to blow up our satellites. So, um, same thing with Tesla. Tesla was like right, right on the edge there of going totally bankrupt. And I think that was that big loan that he got from the government that kind of 500 million or whatever it was at that time, one of those uh, alternative things. Most of the companies at that, that was an Obama era program. Most of those companies went bankrupt that they had given money to, but Tesla borrowed the money and paid it back early. And it was enough to get him over the hump. And I remember him telling the story. He's, he, he had this quote that I thought was so great. I know the quote you're about to mention. I being know. an entrepreneur yep. is like staring into the abyss of death. Chewing, on, uh, chewing glass. Chewing and, glass and staring into the abyss of death. Yeah, because you, it, at the end of the day, it all begins and ends with you. Like over the last couple of years with the, the changes and with all the lockdowns and stuff, that's affected global human interaction, especially my business because a lot of – people that were meeting and dating i mean the overall birth rate has gone down and so and a lot of people are so fucking freaked out they're just not participating by the way i I don't i never told you this but you're the one who i got that quote from originally because you had posted it yeah i put it in my book mastering yourself i didn't do this for myself a friend of mine liked the quote and wanted me he asked for maybe christmas present he said that would be something i'd like so i did it for him and just made a second copy while i was at it what i did was I found an image on Google Images that I thought would fit the quote. And I took the quote and I opened, and I put it in Photoshop, brought the image in. And the image, I don't know how I got so lucky. It's him with the spaceship in the back, in the background. Yeah. And he's staring. It's almost like the photographer said to him, okay, now act like you're staring into the abyss of death. <laughs> it's like that. And I put the quote on there and framed it. It's up in my living room. That's it's, a, cool. it's a quote of Elon Musk with his spaceship behind him, staring off into something, and then it says it has that quote there. But it's true because you're you literally can be on the precipice of of lo- losing everything as an entrepreneur, right. and nobody's coming to save you. It's all right. on you. And yeah, especially you got employees. You got they're all they depend on their paychecks and their ability to pay their bills on you, and so you have to make sure that as an entrepreneur that you handle shit properly. Yeah, that's why I like the quote. Like some people see it on my living room wall and their question, you know, that sounds negative. But when they know the background of the story, you know, because that's what I understand it to be is that is when he got out of PayPal and uh, he got all his money out of PayPal right around the time when the economy was tanking and all three of his companies were in trouble. And he took all of the money and invested into the three sinking companies to try and save them. And he didn't even have enough money to pay rent. He had to borrow it from his friends. So I thought that was around, that's my understanding is that's on the timeline. That so, was when the economy was in the shitter, I think, around 2006 or seven, I think it was. And um, he was just running out of, because the, the thing that all entrepreneurs, myself included, even if we know it, Eventually, what happens is you. It always takes more time and takes more money than you think it's going to to figure out your business model or to to see, succeed and stay in business. And, or and so if like you got a new thing like what he had with Tesla, or SpaceX, it's he had an idea of what he thought it was going to take to figure it out and make it profitable and make it continue to be self sustaining. And as an entrepreneur, it always takes way more, way more time, way more money. And you know, that's why a lot of people, they just up and quit their jobs. And they're like, okay, I'm going to take the money I got. Because I did that after I got out of real estate. I had all, all that money after I liquidated everything. When the market had crashed, I was you know, living the life. I had a nice place. I had plenty of money for I don't know, four or five years. And I'm thinking, yeah, a year, year and a half, I'll be right back making the same kind of money. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a smart guy. I can figure it out. And it took four years, man, and every penny I had. But it was it wasn't until things got really tough, really challenging, really hard, and I was, you know, I was basically waiting tables at 39 years old. And the money I was making, if I go and make 150, 200 a night waiting tables when I was busy during the season, and then I would the next day during my 
day job building this business. I got a new landing page or change something on my website, buy some Google traffic, send a bunch of people, see what happens, how much money I get back. And so since I, I knew how many hours it took to make that kind of money, and then I'm, I literally can blow it in a matter of minutes, get a ton of traffic, and then see what happens with that traffic. And so it causes you to be a little bit more frugal with your money and look at things a different way, a different way to grow the business, different way to, um, to try to spread the peanut butter thinner, if you will, and not waste so much. And you, you become more frugal and because you don't have a choice. You can't spend what you don't have. So it, it causes you to look at problems and, and things in a different way and, and look for frugal ways to get things done. And it's like the analogy that I heard years ago from this internet marketer. He said, you got to think of your online business is like building. Because like the first thing the Wright brothers did, like you were talking about them earlier, mm-hmm. is everybody at that time that was trying to build an airplane – they were always trying to build bigger and more stronger engines because they figured we need more power to get off the ground. And what the Wright brothers did is they looked and studied birds and they watched them as they just kind of glided a lot of the time. And so the first thing they did, <clears throat> first thing they did was, <clears throat> the first thing they did was instead of trying to build a bigger motor, more powerful motor, which is what everyone was doing. And the government was giving them tons of money and you know, these big companies throwing tons of money at the problem. They built a glider and because they figured if we can get something to fly on its own, then we can add an engine to power it and so it can go more. And so what they equated like internet marketing to is like your website. You want to get to the point where your content that's on your website causes people to come and read and navigate around your website, click on ads that are on your website, earn revenue, buy, buy money, subscribe or buy products, services, subscribe to your email newsletter, do all those things. And once it grows organically on its own, because you're adding so much value on there, then you add the engines, which and the engines are like advertising versus trying to spend a lot of money advertising and sending all, all these people to your website because you waste a tremendous amount of money. Now, if you got the resources to do that, you can do it. But especially most entrepreneurs don't have a lot of money. The idea is you, you know, like with the internet, it's content's king. So you make good, useful content that causes people want to tune in, listen to what you have to say, or follow your lessons, or read your musical arrangements, learn from, play from it, or, what, or whatever. And so you become like the trusted expert in your field with each video or piece of content or blog post or article or Instagram image, whatever it happens to be that, that you create. <clears throat> yeah. And then, like I said, that then you add the, the engine to it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's, I guess that's what my, my game, uh, my, um, like I have a four part marketing strategy and I guess that's what it's based off of. If I understand what you're saying, is having a product first and then applying the promotion to it, instead of just promoting when you have. Well, that's what it reminded me of when the when the uh, when the um, pandemic happened, when the quarantine happened, and, and so many musician friends of mine who were accustomed to making all their living only performing, imagine right, because that was just completely stopped when the quarantine happened. Yeah, and they were just posting videos of um, themselves playing themselves playing maybe covers of Margaritaville or whatever and saying, please leave a tip. It just reminded me too much of being on the I-4 ramp with a sign. So I thought to myself, well, I want to try and build content, some, something that people can purchase from me. So then when I promote, I'll be offering something other than just, please, please help me. please, <laughs> You know? Yeah. Yeah. You're offering like a service with it as well, too. Well, you got your lessons, too. Yeah. Right. So you should be doing videos and other posts to offer value right. as a as a teacher. Right. Because then people see that they watch your videos, and then eventually they do a Zoom lesson with you. Right. Exactly. It all plays in together too, because it gives people lessons to more people find you. It all yeah. cycles together, which is right. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. They all help each other out. Yeah. 